Okay, welcome back everybody. Last we were together, we were discussing the physical factors influencing pulmonary ventilation. And one of the things we have to appreciate is the role of surfactant in what we call compliance. High amount of unopposed surface tension causes alveoli to collapse during expiration. This is a condition known as atelic tassis. Surfactant, which is made by type 2 alveolar cells, is a component of liquid film that coats the cells of the alveoli and opposes surface tension's collapsing force. It's similar to detergent and has both a polar and nonpolar end. It disrupts water's ability to hydrogen bond with itself, reducing surface tension and allowing the alveoli to remain partially open even during expiration. If you want an idea of how this operates, um, imagine that you have a wet paper sack and you smash all the air out of it and try to reinflate it. It's quite difficult. But if you were to dunk that sack in soapy water, it would be much easier to inflate due to the ability of the soap to break up the surface tension. Compliance is the last physical factor that influences the effectiveness of gas exchange and this is the ability of the lungs and the chest wall to stretch and it's determined by the amount of alveolar surface tension. Increased surface tension resists the alveolized tendency to inflate and decreases compliance. Surfactant counteracts this collapsing as the force increases. The um, increase in compliance also follows. Distensibility of the elastic tissue gives the lungs ability to stretch during inflation. This increases its compliance. The ability of the chest walls to move or stretch during inspiration also increases compliance. If compliance decreases, the lungs are less able to expand and the effectiveness of pulmonary ventilation decreases. So we're going to find out that there's a class of disorders um, that affect the efficiency of pulmonary function that are called obstructive and restrictive. Okay, In an obstructive disorder, what you have is a reduction in wind speed that ends up causing the lungs to take longer to inflate. Okay, In a restrictive disorder, what we have is an inability of the lungs to open up the way that they would like. So when we're talking about compliance, a reduction in compliance is going to be a hallmark of restrictive disorders. Okay, a lot of restrictive disorders result, for instance, in the scarring of the lungs. The result is that the lungs can't open up the way that they would like. There's other factors that play into this as well. IRDS, as we've discussed previously, is the result of inadequate surfactant production by premature infant lungs from the type 2 pneumocytes. Surfactants not generated significantly until the last 10 to 12 weeks of gestation and premature newborns suffer from infant respiratory distress syndrome. Risk factors include prematurity, male gender, maternal diabetes history, a family history of RDS, and cesarean delivery. The treatment is the delivery of surfactant by an inhalation. It's also um, recommended that we use positive airway pressure <clears throat> or a CPAP device that prevents the alveoli from collapsing during expiration. Mechanical ventilation, a respirator, is used in extreme cases. The next thing we want to discuss are pulmonary volumes and capacities. So take a listen. Lung volumes and capacities, with the exception of the residual volume, Functional residual capacity and total lung capacity are measured with a spirometer. Most spirometers used today are computerized systems that utilize a differential pressure transducer to make measurements that are converted to volumes and flows. These volumes and flows are then displayed on a computer monitor in text and graphic form. The individual pictured here is undergoing a spirometry test. Wearing nose clips, she makes a tight seal with her mouth on the mouthpiece. The technologist then instructs her in performing a variety of maneuvers that will result in the measurement of the lung volumes and capacities. 
Typically, the patient will be instructed to breathe normally and then to take a deep breath all the way in. She will then be instructed to exhale completely. This can be done slowly for a slow vital capacity measurement or rapidly for a forced vital capacity measurement. Lung volumes and capacities are measured using a slow vital capacity maneuver, while air flows are measured using a forced vital capacity maneuver. Pictured here is the spirometry tracing showing all four lung volumes, tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, and residual volume, as well as all four lung capacities, inspiratory capacity, vital capacity, functional residual capacity, and total lung capacity. We will discuss each of these separately. The tidal volume is the amount of gas an individual inspires or expires during normal, quiet breathing. So as you sit there breathing normally, in and out, that's your tidal volume. Normally that volume is 3 to 4 mLs per pound, or 7 to 9 mLs per kilogram, of ideal body weight which is about 8 to 10 percent of the total lung capacity. The inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of gas that an individual can inhale above a tidal inspiration. So as you're sitting there and you make a normal tidal inspiration and then take a deep breath all the way in as far as you can, that's an inspiratory reserve volume. Normally it is 60 percent of the total lung capacity. The expiratory reserve volume is the amount of gas that an individual can exhale beyond a tidal expiration. So as you're sitting there and exhale normally and then push all the gas out that you possibly can, that's your expiratory reserve volume. Normally it is 20 percent of the total lung capacity. The residual volume is the amount of gas remaining in the lungs after a maximal expiration. So as you're sitting there and you blow all the way out as far as you can, the amount of gas that remains in the lungs is the residual volume. Normally it's 20 percent of the total lung capacity. The residual volume cannot be exhaled so it cannot be measured directly with spirometry. The inspiratory capacity is the amount of gas that an individual can inhale starting at a tidal expiration. So as you breathe out normally and then take a big deep breath all the way in, that's the inspiratory capacity. Therefore it includes the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume. You might take an inspiratory capacity before jumping into the water so that you can stay underwater longer. Normally it is 60 percent of the total lung capacity. The vital capacity is the amount of gas that can be exhaled after a maximal inspiration. So what you would do is take a big deep breath all the way in and then blow it all the way out as far as you can and that would be a vital capacity. Therefore it includes the inspiratory reserve volume tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume. The functional residual capacity is the amount of gas remaining in the lungs after a tidal expiration. It includes the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. Normally it is 40 percent of the total lung capacity. The FRC cannot be measured with spirometry because the RV cannot be exhaled and therefore it cannot be measured directly. The FRC has to be measured indirectly using helium dilution, nitrogen washout, or body plethysmography. The total lung capacity is the amount of gas in the lungs after a maximal inspiration. So if you take a big deep breath in and hold it, the volume of gas in your lungs is the total lung capacity. Therefore, it includes the inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume, and the residual volume. Normally it is about 6,000 mLs for adult males and 4,200 mLs for adult females. This is a chart showing you some of the different volumes and capacities. Remember that tidal volume is the amount of air that can be moved in and out of the lungs in a normal resting breathing cycle. The inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of lung capacity that can be forcibly inspired after a normal tidal volume inspiration. The expiratory reserve is the amount that can be blown out after a normal tidal expiration. The residual volume is the air that remains in the lungs after a no normal forceful expiration. So after, for instance, 
a vital capacity takes place and this is the amount of air that allows the lungs to stay uh, retain their shape okay it's not necessarily involved in gas exchange inspiratory capacity is defined as the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve functional residual volume the expiratory reserve and residual volume the vital capacity is the tidal volume and the inspiratory and the expiratory reserve and so that's the amount of air that you can move in and out of the lungs with maximal effort and then total lung capacity is the vital capacity plus the residual volume now pulmonary ventilation only brings new air in to and removes oxygen poor air from the alveoli pulmonary gas exchange occurs as oxygen diffuses from the air in the alveoli to the blood in the pulmonary capillaries while the CO2 flows in the opposite direction. Both of these movements are down their concentration gradients. The two processes that are involved in gas exchange include pulmonary gas exchange that involves the exchange of gases between the alveoli and the blood and tissue gas exchange that involves the exchange of gases between blood and the systemic capillaries in the body cells. Pulmonary gas exchange, also called external respiration, is the diffusion of gas between alveoli and blood. The oxygen diffuses from the air in the alveoli into the blood in the pulmonary capillaries while the CO2 moves in the opposite direction. It converts oxygen-poor, carbon dioxide-rich blood delivered to the lungs by pulmonary arteries into oxygen-rich blood with less carbon dioxide. Oxygenated blood flows through the pulmonary vein to the left atrium of the heart where it can be distributed to all the body's tissues. As with the movement of all gases, pulmonary gas exchange is driven by pressure gradients created by differences in partial pressures of oxygen and CO2 between the air in the alveoli and the blood in the pulmonary capillaries. Blood has a low oxygen pressure, about 40 millimeters of mercury, while the oxygen in the air is at 104 millimeters of mercury and the pressure gradient thus favors the diffusion of oxygen into blood. The pressure gradient it favors the diffusion of carbon dioxide from capillary blood which is 45 millimeters of mercury into the alveoli which is 40 millimeters of mercury is not as steep but is aided by carbon dioxide's relatively high water solubility as compared to the solubility of oxygen. Three additional factors affect the efficiency of pulmonary gas exchange aside from partial pressures and gas solubility. The surface area of the respiratory membranes of both lungs is extremely large, it's about a thousand square feet, while the quantity of blood in the pulmonary capillaries is between 75 and 100 milliliters. Any factor that reduces surface area decreases the efficiency of pulmonary gas exchange. Hypoxemia is low blood oxygen levels a sign of severely impaired pulmonary gas exchange while hypercapnia is high carbon dioxide levels a sign of severely impaired pulmonary gas exchange. The thickness of the respiratory membrane is the distance that a gas must diffuse. Normal membranes are extremely thin. Anything that increases the thickness of the membrane such as inflammation will diminish gas exchange efficiency by increasing the time it takes the gas is to move. Ventilation perfusion coupling is the last factor that affects pulmonary gas exchange. The degree of match between the amount of air reaching the alveoli and the amount of blood in pulmonary capillaries keep ventilation and perfusion closely matched or coupled. Changes in alveolar ventilation lead to changes in perfusion thus blood flow is directed to areas with the most oxygen. Changes in the efficiency of perfusion lead to changes in the amount of ventilation, thus airflow is directed to areas with the most flow. The combination of these two processes ensures that ventilation and perfusion match or are coupled closely to each other. The ventilation perfusion ratio is the measurement that describes this match. When affected by disease, this is called a mismatch. And so what you're seeing here is a behavior in pulmonary tissue that's opposite what you would expect in normal systemic tissue. In systemic tissue when we experience low oxygen or high CO2 we usually see an increase in perfusion following that event. 
in pulmonary tissue, it's reversed. Okay, Low oxygen levels see a decrease in perfusion. High oxygen levels see an increase in perfusion. Tissue gas exchange, also known as internal respiration, is the exchange of oxygen and CO2 between the blood and the tissues. The partial pressure of oxygen and CO2 is the driving force. Okay, um, This pressure difference in systemic capillaries in the tissue provides the gradient that causes the diffusion to take place. Cells use oxygen constantly for respiration, so the partial pressure of oxygen in tissue is low, while the partial pressure of the um, oxygen in systemic capillaries is high, and this steep gradient favors the diffusion of oxygen into tissues. Tissues produce large quantities of carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of cellular respiration, so partial pressure is high while it's relatively low in the systemic capillaries. This pressure gradient and CO2's ability to dissolve in water favors the diffusion of this gas from the tissue into the systemic capillaries. Factors affecting the efficiency of tissue gas exchange include the surface area available for gas exchange of the branch systemic capillaries it needs to be large enough to allow for gas exchange to effectively take place and the distance over which diffusion must occur. The less distance to diffuse results in more efficient gas exchange. The perfusion of the tissue also plays a role. The greater the blood supply results in more efficient gas exchange. In order for pulmonary and tissue gas exchange to occur, oxygen and carbon dioxide have to undergo chemical reactions that allow for these gases to be transported safely in the blood. Now we know that the solubility of CO2 and the solubility of oxygen in water are not equal. CO2 is much more soluble in water than oxygen is, but despite that fact, CO2 is transported in the blood plasma primarily as bicarbonate, okay, a water-soluble derivative of carbon dioxide. So only 1.5 percent of inspired oxygen is dissolved in blood plasma due to its poor solubility, the majority of oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. There are three ways that CO2 is transported in blood, including as bicarbonate, ventilation, and carbon dioxide affect the body's acid-base homeostasis. And the equation that expresses that is shown here. Do this in black. Okay. And it's a very simple equation. CO2 plus water is in equilibrium with carbonic acid which can dissociate into protons and bicarbonate. And it's in this form that it's transported in the plasma. Oxygen transport is facilitated by hemoglobin, which is a protein found in erythrocytes. It's made up of four subunits, each with a heme group, and each heme group contains an iron atom at its core that can bind a single molecule of oxygen. Each hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen molecules as a result. Hemoglobin binds and releases oxygen by two reactions, loading and unloading. During loading, oxygen from the alveoli binds to hemoglobin in the pulmonary capillaries. It converts deoxyhemoglobin into oxyhemoglobin. Hemoglobin with one to three molecules of oxygen is bound partially saturated, while with four molecules of oxygen it's bound fully saturated. Once fully saturated, oxygen-rich blood travels to the left side of the heart, which pumps it to the systemic circulation. During unloading, hemoglobin in systemic capillaries releases oxygen to cells of tissues. The oxygen-poor blood returns to the right side of the heart to be pumped back to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. Oxygen transport, as a result, 
is primarily taking place inside the erythrocytes. The percentage of hemoglobin bound to oxygen is called the percent saturation. Hemoglobin saturation depends on two factors. The partial pressure of oxygen in both lungs and tissues and the affinity or bond strength with which hemoglobin binds to oxygen. One of the main determinants of the percent saturation of hemoglobin is the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood and the tissues. The higher the blood partial pressure, the loading reaction is favored as more oxygen molecules are available to bind to hemoglobin. Lower oxygen partial pressures result in unloading reactions that are favored as fewer oxygen molecules are available to bind to hemoglobin. You can see the relationship between the partial pressure of oxygen and the percent saturation of hemoglobin represented in the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve shown here. The S shape of the curve shows cooperativity between the subunits of hemoglobin. It also indicates that even when partial pressures of oxygen drop fairly low from 100 to 80 millimeters of mercury, the percent saturation of hemoglobin only changes slightly and this helps to load oxygen in the lungs. When the partial pressure of oxygen drops very low to 40 millimeters of mercury, hemoglobin rapidly unloads its oxygen molecules and the percent saturation declines sharply and this provides more oxygen to the tissues. Now what we're going to find out in this video that talks a little bit about hemoglobin is the fact that there are several factors that promote the loading and unloading of oxygen to and from hemoglobin among them pH, temperature, and oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration. So take a listen to this brief explanation and see if it makes sense to you. Welcome back. Let's talk about the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Does it just look like a squiggly line at this point? Well, as usual, that squiggly line has pretty important implications for our physiology. Let's see if we can make sense of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and give your understanding a boost. Here we have an empty graph. Now, the first thing to remember is that a graph represents something we have measured and it compares how two or more measurements relate to one another. In this case, we're comparing the percent saturation of hemoglobin, which just refers to the number of oxygen molecules bound to a hemoglobin molecule, and the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. Remember that a hemoglobin molecule can bind and transport up to four oxygen molecules. Here we have an empty hemoglobin with no oxygen bound to it. In this state, it's said to be desaturated. When we start adding oxygen molecules to hemoglobin, its saturation changes. If we add one to three oxygens, we say hemoglobin is partially saturated. And if we add four oxygens, hemoglobin is now fully saturated. As you've learned, hemoglobin loads oxygen in the pulmonary capillaries, with oxygen moving from the alveoli, where the PO2 is high, to the blood, where the PO2 is low. Notice here that hemoglobin goes from being partially saturated when it enters the pulmonary capillary to being fully saturated when it exits. Hemoglobin then undergoes the reverse reaction by unloading oxygen in the tissues, going from fully saturated when it enters the systemic capillary to partially saturated as it exits. Now, we don't want hemoglobin unloading its oxygen before it gets to these systemic capillary beds, otherwise it won't reach the tissues. For this reason, hemoglobin hangs onto its oxygen molecules pretty tightly until it gets to an area with low oxygen levels. And this brings us to the graph which is showing us how tightly hemoglobin hangs onto oxygen at different oxygen levels. At this part of the graph, oxygen levels are high, and so hemoglobin is fully saturated. This is the situation in the blood in the pulmonary veins and in the systemic arteries, and it keeps hemoglobin from unloading its oxygen here. But see what happens when we get to this part of the curve. 
As oxygen levels drop to about 35 millimeters of mercury, hemoglobin starts to rapidly unload its oxygen, which is indicated by the fact that we go from having about 75% saturation of hemoglobin up here to only about 25% saturation down here. This is the situation in the systemic capillary beds, and this is where we want hemoglobin to unload its oxygen. Notice how the curve is shaped very differently at these two locations. At the top, it's almost flat, indicating that the saturation of hemoglobin changes very little. Whereas here, the curve is almost vertical, indicating that hemoglobin is rapidly unloading its oxygen in the systemic capillaries. This gives the curve its characteristic S shape. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about oxygen transport. The effect of affinity on hemoglobin saturation is determined by four factors that can change hemoglobin's ability to bind oxygen by altering its shape. Increasing temperature decreases hemoglobin's ability to bind oxygen and facilitates the unloading reaction of oxygen into tissues. The reverse is also true. The Bohr effect is a major factor. When the acidity and the carbon dioxide concentration increase, as in tissues with high metabolic rates, hemoglobin binds oxygen less strongly, so more oxygen is unloaded. When the acidity and the carbon dioxide concentration decline, as tissues with slower metabolic rates experience, hemoglobin binds oxygen more strongly, so less oxygen is unloaded. Bisphosphoglycerate is another major player. It's made by erythrocytes as a side reaction of glycolysis. Erythrocytes produce greater amounts of bisphosphoglycerate when hemoglobin is less saturated with oxygen, and this occurs at high altitudes. The bisphosphoglycerate binds hemoglobin, reducing its affinity for oxygen, and this increases the unloading reaction of oxygen to the tissues. Levels of bisphosphoglycerate also increase in response to epinephrine, norepinephrine, thyroxine, testosterone, and human growth hormone. All increase the demand for oxygen by increasing cellular metabolism, and this is another example of the cell-cell communication core principle. Carbon dioxide transport is facilitated in a variety of ways. CO2 is generated as a waste product of cellular metabolism and transported from tissues back to the lungs, both dissolved in plasma, bound to hemoglobin, and as bicarbonate ions. About 10% of the co total carbon dioxide produced by cellular metabolism is transported to the lungs dissolved in blood plasma. 20% of the total CO2 is transported to the lungs bound to hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin polypeptide chains, not the heme group that oxygen binds to. It binds to a different place, and it forms something called carbaminohemoglobin. The remaining 70% of carbon dioxide is transported in blood in the form of bicarbonate ions, which are important in maintaining pH. CO2 quickly diffuses into erythrocytes where it encounters carbonic anhydrase, which is an enzyme that catalyzes the reaction shown here. Carbonic acid is quickly converted into bicarbonate and protons. The bicarbonate can move into the plasma and the protons can reside inside the erythrocyte or in the plasma. Most bicarbonate diffuses into the plasma while the protons bind to hemoglobin. And this acts as a buffer resisting change in pH, which would cause the plasma to become more acidic. Bicarbonate carries a negative charge, and this is counteracted by something called the chloride shift, where chloride ions move into erythrocytes as bicarbonate ions move out in order to balance the charges. The reverse reaction occurs in erythrocytes in the pulmonary capillaries to facilitate the movement of CO2 into the alveoli. Carbonic acid is reformed in erythrocytes from bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. It's then converted into water and CO2 by carbonic anhydrase. The CO2 diffuses out of the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli down its pressure gradient and then is blown out when we exhale. So 
let's talk a little bit about the effect of carbon dioxide on blood pH. The carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system is one of the primary buffer systems in the body. The buffer reaction is reversible and it allows it to respond to different physiological conditions. The pH changes relatively little under normal circumstances. When the pH decreases, i.e. the solution becomes more acidic, the protons bind with buffers like bicarbonate and make carbonic acid. When the pH increases, the same reaction generates protons that decrease the pH. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is a major determinant for the levels of carbonic acid. In turn, carbon dioxide in the blood is primarily determined by two factors. The first is the rate and depth of ventilation, and the second is the rate at which carbon dioxide is generated by metabolism. For this reason, the change in the normal pattern of ventilation have a dramatic impact on blood concentration of hydrogen ions. The carbon dioxide levels in the blood are determined by the following two factors. In hyperventilation, the rate and depth of breathing increases, and this increases the amount of CO2 expired from the lungs reducing the carbon dioxide present in the blood. Less carbonic acid is formed, less hydrogen ions are formed, and the pH of the blood begins to rise. More oxygen may be dissolved in the blood as well. In hypoventilation, the rate and depth of breathing decreases, and this causes retention of carbon dioxide, thus increasing the carbon dioxide concentration. More carbonic acid is formed, leading to more hydrogen ion formation, and the blood becomes more acidic. Oxygen levels in the blood may also drop, and this is a condition known as hypoxemia. Changes in the rate and depth of ventilation can quickly compensate for sudden or dramatic changes in blood pH. Respiratory alkalosis occurs if hyperventilation continues. Hypocapnia, which is a lack of carbon dioxide, results in an increase in blood pH. Respiratory acidosis occurs if hyperventilation continues. Hypercapnia is an increase in carbon dioxide levels that causes the blood to become more acidic. Carbon monoxide is generated from burning organic compounds. It's a colorless, odorless, tasteless compound found in smoke from fire, cigarettes, and exhaust fumes. It binds reversibly with hemoglobin, producing carboxyhemoglobin and it occupies the oxygen binding sites with a 200 to 230 times greater affinity than oxygen does. Thus, small concentrations of carbon monoxide can cause serious problems. Carbon monoxide binding changes hemoglobin shape, increasing the affinity for oxygen, and this decreases the amount of oxygen released into the tissues. Symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning include confusion, dizziness, and nausea, and in severe cases, coma and death. The treatment is 100% oxygen at atmospheric or hyperbaric pressure. Now, how is it that ventilation is controlled by the nervous system? What is the main driver of changes in respiratory rate? Well, breathing usually occurs without conscious thought or control. Disease or homeostatic imbalance affects the respiratory system and makes breathing more of a challenge. Dyspnea is the feeling of shortness of breath that can be the result of many different causes. While eupnea is normal breathing, one of the most vital functions the body carries out as the absence of breathing leads to death. The control of breathing by neurons is found in the brain stem. Specialized cells detect and monitor carbon dioxide levels, proton levels, and oxygen levels in the body. Negative feedback loops and stretch receptors in the lungs also ensure oxygen intake and carbon dioxide elimination match metabolic requirements. The main player here is the brain stem along with what we call the peripheral chemoreceptors. The brain stem, particularly the medulla, is a region of the brain that controls ventilation. Neurons in the pons influence the respiratory rhythm but are not responsible for maintaining eupnea. The respiratory rhythm generator is a group of neurons that creates the basic rhythm of breathing and it's found within a structure called the ventral respiratory column or group. Neurons in the medullary reticular formation assist the, the 
the RRG, the respiratory rhythm generator, known as the ventral and dorsal respiratory groups. They again are shown in the figure. The ventral respiratory group found in the anterior and lateral portion of the medulla contains inspiratory and expiratory neurons. The VRG inspiratory neurons send impulses to the spinal cord that trigger action potentials in the phrenic nerve that innervates the diaphragm and intercostal muscles. This is an example again of the communication core principle. Both nerves also supply certain accessory muscles of inspiration and expiration. The dorsal respiratory group found in the posterior medulla is primarily involved in inspiration, sending impulses along the same pathway to the diaphragm and intercostals as the VRG. The DRG can also integrate sensory information from the blood and lungs and relay this to the VRG. In addition to basic rate and pattern that are set by the RRG, Several other control mechanisms, mostly negative feedback loops, ensure ventilatory needs of the body are met. Don't forget that there is some voluntary control over ventilation supplied by the cerebral cortex that can override or bypass these respiratory centers. Central chemoreceptors also play a role. Chemoreceptors are specialized cells that respond to changes in the concentration of a specific chemical in the blood. Central chemoreceptors are neurons in the medullary reticular formation that initiate a feedback loop by detecting changes in CO2 and proton by monitoring proton levels in the cerebrospinal fluid. Central chemoreceptors relay information to the dorsal respiratory group, which alerts the ventral respiratory group, which responds by changing the rate and depth of respiration to match the detected conditions either stimulating or inhibiting inspiratory or expiratory muscles, leading to the loss or retention of CO2 in the normalization of the pH of the blood. Changes in arterial carbon dioxide concentration are the most powerful stimulus that induces one of the following classic negative feedback loop responses from central chemoreceptors. High carbon dioxide or proton concentration trigger hyperventilation. The VRG is stimulated, which increases the ventilation rate, thus lowering the carbon dioxide and proton levels and restoring homeostasis. Low carbon dioxide or proton concentrations, or both, trigger hypoventilation. The ventral respiratory group is thus inhibited, which decreases the ventilation rate and increases CO2 and proton levels and restores homeostasis. So you can see the flip side of the feedback loop here. The influence of peripheral chemoreceptors also has to be noted. Peripheral chemoreceptors are a group of cells found in the carotid arteries in the aorta that detect a wide variety of stimuli including carbon dioxide and proton levels but they're most sensitive to oxygen changes in arterial blood. When arterial oxygen levels fall below 70 millimeters of mercury, the normal being 100, these chemoreceptors send signals to the dorsal respiratory group along the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves. The dorsal respiratory group uses this information, relaying it to the ventral respiratory group, and this triggers an increase in the ventilation depth and rate. And so you can see the overall picture here. Okay, Voluntary control, the central and peripheral chemoreceptors, all are going to be factors in the rate and depth of respiration. So now let's talk a little bit about some diseases of the respiratory system. There's two main classes, restrictive and obstructive pulmonary disorders. In restrictive disorders we see a decrease in compliance and a reduction in the effectiveness of inspiration by increasing alveolar surface tension and destroying the elastic tissues in the lungs. Inspiratory capacity, vital capacity, and total lung capacity are decreased and this makes effective pulmonary ventilation difficult. Some common restrictive diseases include idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which causes chronic inflammation of lung tissue with eventual destruction of elastic tissue and its subsequent replacement with thick collagen fiber bundles. The cause is unknown, but it's associated with heavy smoking. Pneumoconiosis are a group of diseases that result from the result from 
irritation and inflammation brought about by particulates such as coal, asbestos, fiberglass, and heavy metals. Neuromuscular diseases and chest wall deformities are not purely lung diseases, but potential consequences include pulmonary dysfunction by causing weak inspiratory musculature and or a stiff chest wall. Obstructive lung diseases are a different animal. Okay? They increase airway resistance, which decreases the efficiency of expiration. So basically, they cut down on your wind speed. High airway resistance can lead to the collapse of airways after expiration due to otherwise normal recoil of elastic tissue. This traps oxygen-poor, carbon dioxide-rich air in the alveoli. Typically, residual volume increases and vital capacity drops. This group of diseases includes COPD, which is defined as persistent airway obstruction not fully reversible. Three types include emphysema, small airway disease, and bronchitis. Emphysema is characterized by the destruction of structures of the respiratory zone and a loss of alveolar surface area. Most cases are due to smoking. Small airway disease results when the bronchioles narrow and are typically plugged with mucus. It's commonly associated with emphysema. Chronic bronchitis is characterized by excessive mucus in the airways that has to be cleared by coughing and is caused by an increase in the number and size of goblet cells, mucus glands, and paralysis of cilia on respiratory epithelial cells caused exclusively by cigarette smoke. Asthma is an obstructive disease which triggers the airways to become hyper-responsive to components in the inhaled air. Examples include dust mites, mold, pollen, just to name a few. After exposure to a trigger, the following three responses include bronchoconstriction, an inflammation of the airways, and an increased production of excessively thick mucus. Each of these responses causes a significant increase in airway resistance. Even in the absence of a trigger, the airway in people with asthma is inflamed and contributes to hyperresponsiveness. Lung cancer refers to tumors that arise from epithelia that line the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. There are many types of lung tumors, each with a different predominant cell type, clinical course, and rate of metastasis. The number one risk factor for lung cancer is cigarette smoking, which raises the risk 13-fold, and heavy smoking as much as 60 or 70-fold. Passive smoke increases the risk of developing lung cancer by about one and a half times that of a non-smoker. Now some of the research on this is mixed. Um, there had been in, uh, in previous publications indications that people uh, that were exposed to secondhand smoke had a higher risk of cancer than people who smoked. Obviously the veracity of this data was called into question and thus a lot of the research in secondhand smoke is still up for debate. Okay, that brings us uh, to the end of this podcast. I thank everyone for listening. Remember to review this material as it will be covered on the PRSs and the exams. I'll see you in the next podcast. Good night.